We're glad you're joining us for Living Word Dumaguete's online worship service. We're a gospel-centered evangelical church seeking to win the lost, to lead people to know and worship the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to obey the written Word of God, and to disciple the saints in Christ. Here's today's service, and we pray that it will minister to you. Uh, can we greet the person uh, beside us, uh, the person at our back? Good morning. All right, so just wave your hand. No? Okay, social, uh, social distance pa ta. All right, so praise the Lord and welcome to our uh, morning service. Yeah, so, um, you know, let's just continue to ask the Lord no, to uh, be with us and guide us. Uh, especially as we go on uh, with our activities and as we also continue to serve the Lord. So let's just commit this time to God once again no, as we um, ask the Lord for His wisdom as we dig in, as we study and meditate God's Word this morning. So bow with me as we uh, once again pray. Father, we thank You and praise You, Lord, for this wonderful morning. Thank you for this time that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. And we recognize, oh God, your presence with us this morning. And your presence is what makes this service meaningful. And so, Father, we ask that this morning may you touch our hearts. May you continue to speak to us. That your name be glorified. And even as we meditate your word today, we ask, O oh God, that may you enlighten us, may you illumine your word for us, and that may you open our hearts and spiritual eyes, that may we be receptive to your word. We ask, O oh God, that may you help us to focus and fix our thoughts on you alone, and that this morning as we come out, or as we go out, as we go home today, our hearts be filled with your word and be filled with your instructions. And so, Father, for us as well, that may we be willing to follow, to obey, and to be used by you. And we ask this, O oh God, with the help of your Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. So last Sunday, uh, we started in Matthew chapter 6. And as I've said that, uh, as I shared to you, that we will uh, have this as a series. And we are following the series of our main church. So let me invite you to open your Bible to Matthew chapter 6. And let's read verses 5 and 6. So last Sunday, we discussed verses 1 to 4, and this time, let's talk about the verses 5 and 6. So let me read, and um, let me read from the New American Standard, starting verse 5. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have the reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. For they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. You know what? Religious hypocrisy had become a common place in mainstream Judaism. And this was something that Jesus was bent on exposing during His time. And so last Sunday... I shared to you that Jesus addressed the mass of hypocrisy in alms giving. So in this passage this morning, Jesus gives us another illustration 
of religious hypocrisy. And this time, in the area of prayer. Now, you remember last week, we first looked at a general principle found in Matthew 6, 1, where Jesus says, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men or to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So here, Jesus is stating, or there in verse 1, Jesus is stating a general principle. And that if you perform your religious acts to impress people, then you'll miss God's reward. Now for Jesus, it's not an issue of what you do to worship God, but why you do what you do. Or the reason why you do it that is crucially important. For people, no, or people worship for many reasons. But those who belong to the kingdom of God watch their motives. When you do acts of righteousness before men, no, for example, worship, make sure that you're doing it for God and not just to put on a show for the people around us. And in our, in our day, you know, just like in Jesus' day, there are people who do religious activities just because they want to look good in front of other people. And, and they ask the question, of how can I impress my neighbors? How can I impress my friends? How can I impress my family? Go to church, give to the poor, say my prayers. So Jesus says that if you're involved in a lot of religious activities and just to impress people, then that's, it doesn't mean anything to God. That's not what it's all about. If your motive for going to church or doing some good deed or helping the poor or praying to God or performing some religious activity or even doing your religious duty, if you're doing those to gain admiration of the people around us that it doesn't mean anything to God and to explain the, the general principle Jesus gives us three examples to illustrate and I shared this last Sunday and what he's talking about so three examples are giving praying and fasting so last week we talked about giving to people in need and today we're going to talk about praying particularly the right motive for praying and one thing we will discover here in our study is that sin is something which follows all the way into the very presence of God even in our meaning you know when we come to God in prayer even in our prayer our tendency is to think of self rather than God this is and uh, this is, in truth, self-worship. And Jesus makes us aware of this in His teaching. So let me give you just the outline of our uh, the message this morning. And first one, or the first point, is the posture in prayer. And we see this in verses 5 and 6. So under the posture in prayer, um, first we see... We will see the wrong posture and its negative consequence. And we will also see the right posture and its positive consequence. And the second point is the procedure in prayer. And under this is the wrong method and the wrong expectation. And also the right method and the right expectation. So let's begin with the posture in prayer and wrong posture and its negative consequence so let me read once more verse 5 when you pray you are not to be like the hypocrites for they love to stand and pray and in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men and truly i say to you they have their reward in full in jesus day there were people again whose prayer was nothing more than just but a performance and this is what the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders were doing. They were certain customary times of prayer. And these people made it a point to make sure that when it is time to pray, for example, no, when, when during 12 noon or let's say 3 p.m. Or, or let's say in the morning, 
They were in public place where everyone would be sure to see them praying and hear them praying and, and they get a lot of attention and they love it. So they stood out on the street corners and got, got up in their house of worship and they prayed a prayer that would remember. They were championing prayers. They were prayer warriors. And, and Jesus said, don't try to be like them. That's not what prayer is all about. It's not about performing to people. It's not about impressing the people around you. Stand, the word stand is the normal Jewish uh, posture for prayer and the prayers in the synagogues were led by a member who stood at the front to be invited to do so was a mark of distinction in the congregation. So they feel like special no? when they are the one leading the prayer and they feel good about it. And synagogue is the place, of course, you know, where Jesus worship and where the Word of God is expounded. I mean, it's the place where Jews worship and where the Word of God is expounded. And the streets come from a Greek word which is not referring to a narrow street, but refers to a wide, major street. Therefore, it is a major street corner. And these people, the religious hypocrites, love to have the largest audience. And so here we, we see clearly you know, their motive. We see clearly um, what they love. And it is not that they love God, but they love themselves and they love to impress other people. There were appointed hours of prayer and one who strictly observed afternoon prayer could deliberately time his movements to the most public place at the appropriate time. And so these people may be claiming to talk to God, but in reality, they're talking to people around them. And again, their motive is not because they want to worship God, because they want to commune with God, but it is to impress people. And so God says they'll just get what they're looking for because that's what they want. That was their goal. And so they will get what they want. And so again, the motive, and we, as we see here, it, it is in order to be seen by men. And this is how their far their prayers will go. It reaches men, but not to heaven. Because that's what they want. They do not care. What they care is just about themselves, if how, they, how people perceive them. But the question now for us is that, how do we know? that we are praying hypocritical prayers. How do we know if we are praying hypocritical prayers? How we know if it is done for men and not for God? If, it's a, if our focus is men and not God, in other words, if we seek our own glory. And as it tells us here, um, Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. And the word truly introduces what could be fully relied upon or that is guaranteed that this is true, so believe it and act upon it. Meaning, if that's what they are after, then truly, that's the only thing that they will get. And if you were here last week, no, you remember that this is an accounting term. It means it's paid in full. And it was the word used when issuing someone a receipt that those who pray to impress people get the reward of impressed people. And that's all. The prayer doesn't mean anything to God because it's not for Him. It wasn't really a prayer to God or for God and so He doesn't really have anything to do with it. And so that's the guaranteed truth. The reward has already been received because they sought approval from men and got it already and there's nothing to look forward in heaven. And that's the price for being a religious hypocrite. And that's what you get no, if that's what you're after. And a religious act of worship designed to impress people instead of serving God. So, in other words, prayer even can be just you know, an act of performance. 
and saying the right words in the, in the right way, smoothly, loudly, and clearly, posing at just the right moments for effect. When, you know, when I was in... Uh, I was in Bible school. I remember the time, no? And there was a time that I tried to impress my professor. I think I was in first year college or in, uh, first year uh, in, in Bible school at the time. And I was asked to pray during our chapel hour. And during the chapel hour, no? So I led the prayer. And um, I, I cannot remember the exact prayer I, I made, but... What I can remember is that after I made a public prayer in front of the of my classmates of the many students, my prof, one of our professors, you know, grabbed me, you know, and he he wanted to talk to me, and he asked me this question: Do you know how many times you mentioned the word in your prayer, Father God? I said, nah, I don't know, sir. And then he, I did not know that he counted it. I think it was, I forgot how many, but I know it was more than 10. And so he corrected me and, and he gave even me an illustration. He said that, you know what, when you write a letter to your parents, let's say to your father, do you always say father, that, 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 this and that, father, blah, blah, blah. And said he said and then so he, he made it a a a, a compar- an, an, an analogy of that and then he said no in the same way when we pray to God no, we should be praying like this as well you know as much as I agree with him with all my heart and in fact no, that changed the way I prayed after that no I, I I was more conscious of myself but as much as I learned from that and this that, also, and every every time I'm asked to pray, I'm no longer my conscious is that I, I'm more I more think I'm more conscious of praying to for my professor than praying to God. Why? Because I don't want him to grab me again and you know correct me with how I pray. And that's that was the you know I think that was the disadvantage of that. And what I'm just saying is that when we pray, you know, we are too concerned with getting it right. I mean, we should be praying the right prayers. And, and if that is the reason, but if the, the reason why we're so concerned about is that because other people are listening, because we want our prayers to sound good to them, then it's not really what prayer is all about. And so, a hypocritical prayer, it's, it's like a public speech, you know, a presentation to man. And it is done for man's praise so people will ooh and ah and wow. And the reward is, and the reward of that is paid in full. You receive human praise. So let's talk about this time, the right posture and its positive consequence. And verse 6, but you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. The word inner room is windowless. You know, if, you, if you've seen pictures of, uh, you know, the Jewish houses, uh, the inner, their inner room is windowless and possibly with the only lockable door in the house. It is thus proverbial for a secret place. So it's, so it's like Jesus was telling here that, you know, when you pray, go somewhere, some place where you can't be seen. A hidden place and, 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 and God who, can, who also can't be seen will meet you in that hidden place. Well, Jesus, not just, just to, I want us to take note that Jesus is not forbidding public or communal prayer here, all right? Jesus is not forbidding us from public prayer. But he is forbidding, what he's forbidding here is questionable motives. Well, for example, in Acts 12, 12, no? um, there in the story, if you remember this passage, that Peter got out from prison and then Peter went to the house where the, the disciples or where uh, the other, uh, where, you know, the rest were staying. 
And when he realized, and then Acts 12, 12 tells us, and when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many people were gathered together and were praying. So, of course, we see a lot of examples of public prayer, congregational prayer, especially in the book of Acts. But why is it that Jesus is telling us here to shut your door, be alone with God when you pray? By the way, the, 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 the shut your door, uh, what means by this is that true prayer happens when you forget yourself and others and simply be lost in the presence of God. No distractions, and it's just between you and God. It's more than a, it's, it's really a heart attitude. So when you pray, make it a prayer between just you and God. Let me share to you a confession of a pastor, and this is what he said. I've got a confession to make. You know what's really hard for me about prayer? It's hard for me to pray to God because I can't see Him. I'm a big people person. I love to talk to people, but I can see people, and I can see God. So it's really hard for me to pray to the unseen God, and when I am praying all by myself, I get easily distracted. My mind wanders, and suddenly I realize that somewhere about five minutes ago, I must have stopped praying. You know what helps me with that? Praying with other people. We're there for a common purpose, and that helps me focus on prayer. My visible brothers and sisters help me sense the presence of the invisible God. So for me, it is big help to pray together in a group and to pray out loud. But here's another way you can keep your focus on God during prayer. And this is what he said. Pray out loud even if you're alone and no one else but God is listening. And that helps me. Your hidden place doesn't need to be in a closet. It doesn't even need to be indoors. Go for a walk and talk to God. You might look a little strange to the neighbors, but so what? Talking out loud helps me have a conversation with a God that I cannot see. So he was just sharing his testimony, or rather his, his, his struggle when it comes to praying. And you can pray while even riding in a, on a jeep, as long as, of course, you can concentrate and have a right focus. So it tells us here, pray to your Father. And so the essence of prayer is the communion of the disciple with the Father. That's what prayer is all about. And then the Father, it tells us here, and then truly, uh, but when you, um, uh, but verse 6 again, but you, when you pray, go into your room, close your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you or repay you. So this prayer is heard by God, the kind of prayer that is really between God and you is heard by Him and He will answer. But the prayer, the person who prays more in public than in private reveals that he is less interested in God's approval than in human praise. So those who pray from pure motive will be rewarded by God. And what reward? What is this reward? What is the reward of prayer? Well, I think the reward he's talking about here is that God will hear your prayer and answer it. And I think that's what matters most. That God hears us because we are, when, when we pray, you know, as long as when we pray from, with a mere, pure motive, not for how it will look, but because you love God and you want to honor Him and obey Him, then God will reward you. And that is, He will answer you. And I think it's important to remember that the answer God gives us may not always be the answer that we want. But God promised that when we pray to Him, not pray so others will applaud, but when we really pray to Him, then He will answer our prayers by giving us whatever answer is the very best, whatever answer that is best for us. 
So the question is, must it always be in secret? Because again, Jesus tells us to go into your inner room and pray to your Father there who is in secret. Must it always be in secret? Well, I don't think that this verse means, or rather what this tells us that it doesn't mean that all prayers must be done in private. Again, we see examples in the, old, in the New Testament. Jesus himself even sometimes pray out loud with his disciples present. In the book of Acts, again, no, there, are very, or there are several examples of public prayer. So what he's trying to say is that prayer is something that you say to God first and foremost. And even if it's out loud and other people can hear it, remember that you're not talking to other people, but you're talking to God. Prayer is first and foremost talking to God and, and you, you're just letting the people listen in your conversation between you and God. So Jesus is saying even if you're with other people, keep your communication between you and God alone. Well, if this is a problem, then we need to pray in our closet so that we won't be tempted to impress other people with our prayers and that way our motive could not possibly be to gain human approval so jesus is not saying that you've done something wrong if other people heard your prayer he's not even saying that it's wrong even it's it's wrong if ever people are impressed by your prayer is jesus is not even saying that what he's saying is that it is wrong to pray for the purpose of impressing people. And that's not, because that's not the reason why we pray. And so it's not an issue of who prays, or who knows, rather, who knows about it. It's not an issue of who knows about it. Rather, or, or what they think about it, but it's all about your motive. And why did you do it? Why do you pray? Is it for people or is it for God? So a lot of times people at the same time or on the other hand, a lot of people also are afraid to pray out loud in front of someone else, right? There are people as well no, nga, who don't like to pray in public. And maybe that's one of us. That when we are asked, can you pray for the food in front of Others and want to know, siyo lang ba ito, no? Katulong siya, ay lungko, no? Well, if you feel that way, no, it's okay to pray to God. You know, actually, it's, of course, no, we, we pray to God, no? And, but if you're uncomfort, uncomfortable in praying in front of other people, and you find it hard, i just like to suggest something here. You know what? Ignore all those people. It doesn't matter what they think because what's important is that you talk to God. Your real thoughts in your own words and in your own way. Just be yourself and because God already knows who you are. He knows what you're praying. He knows the things that you want to say even before you say that. And He loves you. And so just talk to Him and don't worry about anyone who might be listening. Because again, when we pray, we are not talking to each other. We're talking to God in front of each other. And so, the second one is the procedure in prayer. The wrong method and the wrong expectation. So, that was the first one, the wrong uh, the motive. And now it's time to talk about the procedure. So, in verse 7, And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. For they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. And I want to take note the word when. It doesn't say if you pray, but rather when you are praying, indicating that prayer is not optional. And there was a farmer who was paid a visit by one of his city relatives. Before dinner, the farmer bowed his head and said grace. His sophisticated relative jeered. This is old-fashioned. Nobody with an education prays at the table anymore today. 
The farmer admitted that the practice was old and even allowed that there was some of his farm or some on his farm who did not pray before their meals. Justify the relative remark. So enlightened, uh, so enlightenment is finally reaching the farm. And so he asked, who are these wise ones no, who did not pray? And the farmer replied, only the pigs. You know what? Prayer is not old school. No? We, we know that prayer is not old school. And that's why let's not be shy you know, to initiate prayer. And the word meaningless repetition here, the Greek word is bat batalogé or uh, with a long O, which means empty bubbling, speaking without thinking. The kind of prayer that when we pray, we just, you know, um, sputter words. We're just, you know, saying words without even thinking about the words we are saying. And main, many ancient religions had the idea that someone could persuade the gods to act if they just said the magic words over and over again. The word bubbling means to say bata, bata, bata. Bata is just a meaningless phrase during the ancient time. And it's kind of a, like a rain dance. Just hit on the right magic formula and keep repeating it until you get the results. And is it not what we see today? Is it not what you know the people are doing right now? That we hear them, no? Um, praying and over and over again the same kind of prayer and we wonder if they are really thinking through their prayers but how about us are we like this well just a note here jesus also is not prohibiting repetition of prayer all right he's not i mean he's not it's not a prohibition of repetition of, in prayer because there are just times that we pray the same things especially when we pray and, and there are just times that you know we're praying for something that we've been praying for so long and we've been keep we, 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 we're, we keep repeating that before God and Jesus is not saying that there's anything wrong with repeating yourself in prayer because the Bible records this one time when Jesus prayed the same thing three times in a row. We find that in Matthew 26, 44. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying that same thing once more. So even Jesus practiced a repeated prayer. And he also told us a story about a persistent widow to teach us that we should keep praying for something and never give up. So what is really the issue here? The issue here is that when we pray without really understanding what we are praying. When we are praying just simply in saying the words again and again, because we thought that, that by many words, God will hear. Well, Jesus tells us here, as the Gentiles do, because the, the kind of prayer the Gentiles the, this gentle people do is that their prayer was characterized by thoughtless mechanical prayer with formal invocations and magical incantations in which correct repetition was more important than attitude and intention in worship just imagine that you know what even today this is true because many buddhist shin wheels containing written prayers, believing that each turn of the wheel sends that prayer to their God. And Buddhists also, by the way, of Spanish Muslims counted of repeated prayers using beads. And the problem uh, during the time is that the Jews adopted this kind of thinking. And there's a Jewish maxim that says, everyone who multiplies prayer is heard. And that's why Jesus said, don't be like the Gentiles. William Barclay, in a most helpful discussion of this passage in the Gospel of Matthew, points out that over the years, a number of faults had crept into Jewish prayer life. For one thing, prayer had become ritualized. The wording and forms of prayers were set and were then simply read or repeated from 
memory. Such prayers could be given with almost no attention being paid to what was said. They were a routine, semi-conscious religious exercise. A faithful Jew would repeat the Shema early in the morning and again at night. And the, that prayer which began, Hear, O Israel, this is what the Shema is. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And that is a composite of selected phrases from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and Numbers. And often an abbreviation version was only used. So both the Shem and the Shemone, Ezra, were to be said every day, regardless of where one might be or what one was doing. Wherever one was, whether at home, in the field, at work, on a journey, in the synagogue, or visiting friends, at the appointed time, the devout Jew stopped what he was doing and offered the appropriate prayer. The most common times were at the third, sixth, and ninth hours. Others went through the words perfunctorily, mumbling the, the syllables as fast as possible just in order to finish. Others such as, as the scribes and Pharisees recited prayers meticulously, making sure to enunciate every word and syllable properly. Three times a day, they had a ready-made opportunity to parade their piosity. So they became more technical and and they made sure that they were able to, you know, to say the right, to say it the right way, to pronounce it in the right way. And that was prayer for them. Does it sound familiar? You know what? These people are more concerned with the form of prayer than the object of prayer. Because again, prayer is just merely a show off. A routine devoid of true devotion and worship. So, brothers and sisters, how do we know that we are praying hypocritical prayers? Let me share to you um, two reasons no? or two things. Number one, if they are done routinely and is merely a lip service. Prayer is just but hypocritical if they are done routinely and is merely lip service. Let me share to you a story of a man who sat down to supper with his family and said grace. Thanking God for the food and for the hands who prepared it. And for the source of all life. But during the meal, the father, or this man, Complain about the freshness of the bread, the bitterness of the coffee, and the sharpness of the cheese. And so his young daughter questioned him, Dad, do you think God heard the grace today? He answered confidently, Of course. Then she asked, And do you think God heard what you said about the coffee, the cheese, and the bread? And not so confidently, he answered, Why, yes, I believe so. Then the little girl concluded, Then which do you think God and which do you think God believed? That then the man was suddenly aware that his mealtime prayer had become a rote, thoughtless habit rather than an attentive and honest conversation with God. So by not concentrating on the important conversation, he had left the door open to let hypocrisy in. So that's number one, huh? when, we, when they're done routinely and it's merely lip service. Secondly, if they are insincere, insincere, meaning fake or not genuine, insincere prayers. You know, we sing, I think it's there, right? You know, we sing sweet hour of prayer and are, and are content with five to ten minutes a day. We sing onward Christian soldiers and wait to be drafted into his service. We sing all oh, for a thousand tongues to sing and don't use the one we have. We sing there shall be showers of blessing, but do not come when it rains. We sing blessed be the tie and that binds and, and let the least little offense severe it. We sing serve the Lord with gladness and gripe about all we have to do. We sing I love to tell the story and never mention it at all. 
we sing marching to Zion but fail to march to worship or church or to go to church. We sing cast thy burden on the Lord and worry ourselves into a nervous breakdown. We sing the whole wild, wide world for Jesus and never invite the next door neighbor. We sing all day of rest and gladness and wear ourselves out traveling, cutting grass or playing golf on Sunday. We sing throw out the lifeline and content ourselves with throwing out a fishing line. Meaning, it's just but hypocrisy. So two reasons for prayers of meaningless repetition. Why is it that you know, people pray meaning, uh, uh, thus uh, meaningless repetition because it does not demand concentration and secondly, indifference to real communion with God. And they think that for the many words, this is what Jesus said here, many words. But by the way, Jesus is not condemning many words. It, Jesus does not say, it, it's not saying us, that you know you only pray five minutes prayer because if you reach 30 minutes prayer that's already long all right but because remember jesus one time prayed all night prior to his crucifixion but what god is much concerned is the quality of prayer than the quantity of prayer and it's not the length of prayer but the strength of prayer that prevails with God. So the emphasis is that prayer must be a sincere expression of the heart. And then we go to the last, the right method and the right expectation. Verse 8, So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. You know what? God does not give in to your prayer just because he is worn out, exhausted by our long, repetitious prayer. But God answers prayers because He has a fatherly concern. It's not because we've prayed a long prayer. It's not because we've been repeating that over and over again. But simply because He is a father to us. That's why Matthew chapter 6, after these two verses, we find the Lord's Prayer, wherein Jesus teaches us how to pray. And, and, and the Lord's Prayer is for the disciples of Jesus Christ. It's not, no, I'm just giving you a heads up here, it's not for the non-Christians. It's not for those people who do not have Jesus. Because when Jesus taught his disciples the expectation is God will hear them because he is their father and that's why God answers prayers because he has a fatherly concern and so this is the right way to to pray you know we are then to relate to him as father you know when you talk to your earthly father do you talk to him mechanically and with meaningless repetition of course, the answer is no, right? Prayer is powerful when we relate to God as a father and as an answering God. Abraham's servant prayed and Rebekah appeared. Jacob wrestled and prayed and Esau's mind was turned from 20 years of revenge. Moses prayed and Amalek was struck. Hannah prayed and Samuel was born. Isaiah and Hezekiah prayed, and in 12 hours, 185,000 Assyrians were slain. Elijah prayed, and there were three years of drought. He prayed again, and rain came. Let me share to you a true story. You know what? After Dallas Theological Seminary was founded in 1924, this is one of the prominent schools uh, uh, theological schools in the U.S., it also came to the point of bankruptcy. All the creditors were going to foreclose at noon on a particular day. That morning, they met in the president's office with Dr. Schaefer for prayer that God would provide. In that prayer meeting was a man by the name of Harry Ironside. 
And when it was his turn to pray, he prayed in his characteristic manner. So this is how Harry Ironside prayed. Lord, we know that the cattle on a thousand hills are thine. Please sell some of them and give us the money. And while they were praying, a tall Texan with boots on and an open collar stepped up to the business office and said, I just sold two carloads of cattle in faith, uh, in, in, in some, there's a, a place, an FD worth, and I've, I've been trying to make a business deal, but it fell through, and I feel compelled to give the money to the seminary. I don't know if you need it or not, but here's the check. A little secretary took the check, knowing how critical things were financially, went to the door of the prayer meeting and timidly tapped when she finally got a response. Dr. Schaefer took the check out of her hand and it was exactly the amount of the debt. When he looked at the name, he recognized the cattle man and turning to Dr. Ironside, said, he said, Harry, God sold the cattle. And it's a true story. You know, my previous pastor graduated from this theological school. And so, indeed, you know, the Father answers the prayers of His people when they are done out from a pure motive, out of a sincere heart, and for the glory of His name. And verse 8, again, Father, the Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Brothers and sisters, the right expectation is that God knows our needs. And since he's a good father, he will give us what we need. The reason it's so important to guard our motives in prayer is because the reason why we pray will determine the outcome. Let me repeat myself. Why is it important to guard ourselves or guard our motives in prayer? Because the reason why we pray will determine the outcome. And Jesus urges us to pray in secret so that our motives will be completely pure. By the way, just a side question. If the Father knows already, because it tells us here, the Father already knows our prayer, why do we still need to pray? If He already knows, if God already knows, what we are to pray, and why do we need to pray still? Well, sometimes that's what people wonder. If God already knows what I need, then why should I tell Him about it in prayer? Well, the answer is that even though God doesn't need us to tell Him, we need us to tell Him. We need us to tell Him. We need to tell God when we talk to God, no, we, 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 it reminds us that we are dependent upon Him. And that it demonstrates that we trust in Him. And we need that. We don't need to wake God or get His attention. He never sleeps and He is already watching us. All we need to do is to talk to Him honestly and sincerely. So that's it. It's to show our dependence. And sometimes... God would bring us to our wit's end for us to be able to pray. And all these trials, God tells us that we need to pray and prayer must be a matter of desperation amongst us. And you know what? More than changing things, prayer changes people. It changes us. And it causes us to be more dependent on God. So in conclusion, brothers and sisters, God wants us to pray. God wants you to pray. And don't be intimidated. Not because He needs to know what you want or what you think. It's because praying to God is an act of worship. And that's why it's important that you pray with a right motive. You can say the longest, most eloquent prayer for the wrong reasons so that the people will praise you. But then, that's all you get. People's praise. 
And on the other hand, the shortest, even the shortest, the most simplistic way, the most simplistic prayer offered sincerely and offered only because you want to honor and obey God, that prayer will bring His reward. And the question is not just, are you praying? The important question is, why are you praying? And that's why we must rid ourselves of the sin of self-worship, disguised with a holy cloak. Rather, we are to do things only for the worship of God, who alone is worthy. Let's pray. Father, you are our Heavenly Father, our Abba. And we thank you that we can come to you, we can draw near to you, and your nearness, O oh God, is our good. The reason why we can come because of your Son, Jesus, who paved the way, who made a way for us, that we can come boldly in your throne of grace because of what he has done on the cross. But Father, we confess that many times we have neglected prayer. Many times we took for granted, O oh Lord, uh, this privilege that you have given to us. We ask for forgiveness if we fail to trust in you. And we thought, O oh God, that prayer is not effective. But we also fail to see and check our motives. If it is just for self or for your glory. And so Father, I pray for us this morning that may you remind us that you're the God who's willing to listen. Who's willing to answer in accordance to your perfect will. So, Father, may we be encouraged once again to come to pray. Not just to pray individually in our homes, but as well as even join prayer meetings of the church. We pray not to impress each other, but we pray, oh God, to you. Because you alone is worthy of our worship. You alone, O oh God, is able to do exceedingly mightily more than we can ask and imagine. So Father, I ask that may you strengthen the faith of your people, our faith. And may we truly experience you, O oh Lord, in times of prayer. Thank you, O oh God, for your word. Thank you, Father, for this wonderful morning. And we commit to you the rest of this day. I pray for your blessing and protection for each one. Whatever has been achieved, do you be the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name.
Brothers and sisters, you may now go with the love of God. 